you a few verses um, from the Bible, from Psalm 34. And, uh, um, you know, in my, in, in my Bible, I've, I've underlined the, the first few verses of this um, because it was, it was a passage that, that helped us and encouraged us through the coronavirus. And it does seem that we've sort of just come through the coronavirus or starting to come through the coronavirus and then suddenly, you know, we're now faced with conflict in Ukraine and the situation there. And, um, you know, I think all of us, you know, feel, feel, feel quite fearful about that. It's almost we've moved from one thing, one crisis, in to another. And, uh, and I do want to encourage you this morning, church, God is in control. And we have to trust God. He is our hope and our refuge. And, and I'm going to be talking about this next week and talking about surviving the storm. And, uh, you know, we have to trust God in this situation. But as a church and as the people of God, we have to pray. You know, the, the, <laughs> the call of God upon us is to pray, to intercede. And uh, we have to, as a church family, stand in the gap. You know, we can give, we can support, but the most important thing is that we pray. Because prayer does make a difference. And so I want to, you know, we're, this isn't just a token gesture, you know, for the people in Ukraine this morning. You know, this is vital to what is going on in our world, that the church rises up and prays and intercedes. As we pray this morning, we are making a difference. We are taking authority. And uh, in a little while, you're going to hear from Sasha, who is a missionary in the middle of Ukraine. And uh, he will encourage you to pray for what's going on in his country at this time. But let me read this passage to you. Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exhort his name together. Friends, prayer starts with praise. You know, in every situation, we, we lift God up. We praise his name. We worship him. That's why it was so great that we started this morning singing, he's worthy of it all. Because even in a crisis, God is still in control. And we need to start with praise and worship this morning. In verse 4 it says, I saw the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. In verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Verse 17, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. The Lord will rescue his servants. So many promises there in Psalm 34. And I want us to start by praising God this morning. And then we are going to stand in the gap for the people of Ukraine. We are also going to pray for the people of Russia as well. Because they deserve our prayer. You know, Russian people are not the enemy. And so we need to pray for Russian people and Ukrainian people and all those that are caught up in the conflict. We need to pray for the regime in the Kremlin. And we need to pray that they will cease their atrocities in the name of Jesus. And we need to pray against the principalities and powers that are behind all of this. And we need to take authority against them in the name of Jesus. So we are praying for Ukraine, yes, but we are also praying for the people of Russia and we're praying um, against the atrocities that are going on um, and being implemented by the Kremlin and we are praying and binding principalities and authorities in the spiritual realms this morning. But before we do that, I want you to just listen to Sasha, who is a missionary we support. He works in the middle of Ukraine and uh, he uh, is just going to speak to us this morning and plea for us to pray. So if we can play that now, Lizzie, that would be great. Thank you. 
Hi to everyone. My name is Sasha. I'm from Ukraine. Dear Church, thank you very much for praying for Ukraine for us. Things that are happening over here are not easy at all. They are very, very hard. Russians are assaulting Ukraine from the north, south, east. A lot of Russians, a lot of military equipment. That is very hard for us, particularly in Kharkov, around Kiev, in Kherson, Mariupol, and in many other places in Ukraine. Many Ukrainians suffered and are suffering terribly. Atrocities of war. You can watch them on TV. What words can describe people's sufferings? Dear Church, only our prayers can stop them. Russian troops, tanks, fighting jets, missiles, artillery, suffering of Ukrainian people, children, and give us peace. Second Chronicles 20, verse 12. For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Verse 15. Thus says the Lord to you, don't be afraid. Not dismayed, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Verse 17. You will, not, you, you will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, who is with you. We Ukrainians are keep, keeping our eyes on the Lord, our dear God. And salvation from Russians, Russian army, is coming from you, our Lord, through our prayers. May they, Russian troops, bring terrible fear on Ukrainian soul, as a Midianites were when Gideon defeated them. Please, dear Church, pray that it will be no that it will not be a lack of food and water for people. Please pray for the mothers and children, most vulnerable ones. Psalm 47, verse 19. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Thank you, Lord. Your shields are protecting Ukraine, our president, troops, people, mothers, children. May God bless Ukraine. And have a great mercy upon all of us and give us a great peace. Thank you, Church. Let's stand together. As a church family, let's stand together. Let's stand in the gap. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord Jesus. That was recorded by Sasha yesterday and sent across to us. Uh, Dean Kitchener and Angela Oakley and myself are in regular contact speaking to um, Sasha on WhatsApp and uh, by text as well. But let's just, all of us have been watching the news and seeing the pictures. Let's, let's just pray. But let's start by just praising God and start by worshipping God. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. Lord God, we want to say, Heavenly Father, you are worthy of it all. Lord, you're worthy of our praise. Lord, we give you praise and glory. Lord, we thank you that you are a faithful God. Lord, we thank you for all those things that we've mentioned this morning, for provision, for peace, for protection for forgiveness and salvation. Lord, for our entire existence, Lord, we give you worship and praise this morning. Lord, you are a good God and we lift your name on high. Lord, you are the God who is in control. Lord, the, the, the mountains, the fields, the, um, the, every nation, Lord, is yours. Lord, you um, are, 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 are worthy of it all, Lord. You are high and above all, Lord. And we trust you because you are a good God, good, good God. And you are our Father, our perfect Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning. We worship you. Your people praise you this morning. And Lord, we cry out, Lord, for the people of Ukraine. Lord, we cry out for the people of Russia.
Russia, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that uh, there will be safe corridors, Lord, for people to find hope and peace and refuge. Lord, we pray there will be ceasefires. And Lord, those ceasefires will hold in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we pray these atrocities will stop in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray, Lord, for the Kremlin, Lord. And we pray they will come to their senses. And Lord, we pray that truth will come out, Lord. And Lord, we pray that these, uh, this invasion will stop in the name of Jesus. Lord, we pray for a cessation, um, to, for the, the atrocities to cease, Lord, and, and people, Lord, to find hope and refuge in you, Lord. We pray for the people of Russia, Lord. Lord, we pray that you will protect them, Lord. And Lord, we pray they will rise up against what's going on in their country. And Lord, that you will just, Lord, um, take control of that situation. Lord, in the name of Jesus, and we pray for every single Ukrainian, Lord, that has been uh, displaced from their home. Lord, we thank you for the hospitality they have received from, Lord, other nations. Lord, we thank you for the people that have given up their cars to take people to where they need to go and, and given up their food and, and their clothing. And, Lord, we thank you for the amazing um, hospitality that's been shown, Lord, these, the, the people that are fleeing their country and Lord we pray your blessing on those that are helping and Lord we pray in the name of Jesus many people will come to know you as their Lord and Saviour and Lord your protection will be over that nation Lord we pray for Sasha Lord we pray you will fill him and his wife and his girls his children Lord with hope in the name of Jesus Lord we pray over this situation Lord bring peace Lord bring peace and Lord we bind the principalities and the powers behind this in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord we recognise Lord what is going on here. We recognise that Lord principalities and powers are rising up and we bind them in the name of Jesus and Lord we stop them having influence over Russia, over Ukraine, over other areas of Europe. We pray and bind them in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we are seated in heavenly places with you. And Lord, we thank you your church can take authority over what is going on in our world. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, for your glory. Amen. We're starting a new series this morning, and it's the miracles of Jesus leading up to the greatest miracle of all, which is the resurrection. Um, and our speaker this morning is John Morris. He's one of our leaders here at Sawyer's Church, one of our trustees on our leadership team as well. So let's put our hands together as John comes to speak to us this morning. Thank you. the rest is downhill quite frankly. Um, it's, it's great to be with you this morning. Um, my name is John Speed, so part of the leadership team um, and uh, in my spare time I'm, I'm a head teacher of a local primary school. Um, in fact I'm far more used to speaking to children than I am to adults. Um, but you know it's really exciting to, to launch this series and I don't think there's ever been a time when a series is in season because what the world needs now is a miracle yeah. and, and I, I believe as we we go through this series what I want to encourage us as a church 
is to sort of look at the principles, see what was happening in Jesus' time, because believe me, it can happen now. Yes. And the only hope for this world, the only hope for world peace at this yeah. moment is that it's a miracle. Do you believe that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so today I've, I've, I'm going to call my talk Fill to the Brim, and hopefully you'll understand that in a moment. But I just want to say to you, miracles do happen. Um, about 10 years ago, Val and I were privileged to go to Uganda. It was part of our involvement with the charity Watoto. And we were staying in Kampala, which is the sort of base of Watoto. And um, we were then going to go to the north of the country to a place called Gulu, a war-stricken land. Um, and I was thinking about that this morning. The people of Gulu, previous to that, were probably experiencing very some of the atrocities that the people of Ukraine are experiencing now. So the first miracle was that um, it was Val and I, um, and we were surrounded by men and women of faith. Uh, we were there with the, the pastor, lead pastor of, of Hillsong, a guy called Gary Clark. We were there with Ken uh, Williamson and his wife Christine. Uh, we were there with Gary Skinner, who was heading up uh, Watota and his wife Marilyn. And when they told us we're going to Gulu, it's about 350 miles away. And I thought, my goodness, this is going to take days. But they said, we've chartered a plane. Um, and <laughs> it sounds grand, but we were taken to this field where there's a twin propeller plane. Now, the first miracle, those of you who know my wife, Val, she doesn't like traveling at the best of times. She doesn't like flying. In fact, it got to a point where she wasn't going to come <laughs> because it seemed to me it was scary. But I remember the people around us, we prayed for Val. She got on that plane and we traveled to Gulu. That was a miracle, that wasn't it? It was an absolute miracle. But when we got there into this war-stricken land, God had told Gary and Marilyn to build a village for children, to plant a church in Gulu. Okay? And the idea of us going there was to take us to this place where they were going to build this children's village and a new worship center in Gulu. And we got off the plane, we journeyed along these sort of muddy roads, and we got to this place which in fact was just like a field, and some building had just started. And I remember Gary Skinner saying to the group of people he was showing, God has given me a vision for this place. We're going to bring revival to this part, this war-stricken land. God is going to heal this land. And we're going to build a village which is going to build a, be a hope and a future for the people. And my goodness, you know, when this guy is talking, I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. I don't think, Lord, but forgive my unbelief. There's just a, there's just a field. And we're in a war-stricken place. And as we get there, he goes and he said, yeah, this is where we're going to build. And we're going to bring people from Britain across as teams to start building. And it was all very exciting. And then he said the one thing, so we have a problem. He said, we have a problem that when we build the village, we don't know where we're going to get water from. Because it's an arid, desolate place. A bit of a small problem, you might think. Why build a village if you haven't got water? And as we were walking down, and I, part of me is thinking, my goodness, this is, this is ridiculous. You're building a village, there's no water. And Gary says to him, because God is going to supply our needs. Wow, this is a man of faith. Oh Lord, forgive my unbelief. And as we walked there, we could see the foundations of some of the buildings. And they were actually starting building. And just as he was there, a bulldozer was excavating okay, a footing for one of the houses. It struck water. Wow. The bulldozer was submerged in water. The bulldozer could not build. But actually, water was there. That's a miracle, isn't yeah, it? And, and for me, what was a lesson you know, we, we're talking about today, for, for Gary, he, he saw a solution. He didn't focus on the problem. And I think as we look through these, these miracles of Jesus, there are 47 um, in the New Testament, I believe. And we're going into John's Gospel, where there, there are eight, yeah. okay? Yeah. And what I wanted to encourage us to do is, is to look at them, and, and look at them afresh. Because I believe God is going to reveal new things to us. Because when John writes his Gospel, he talks about signs. He talks about these miracles as signs. And he says, Jesus did many more signs and yeah. wonders yeah. that are not recorded here, but these are written that you might believe. 
and, and, and sorry, I, I want you to encourage us, when we read these miracles, we might be familiar with them, but let's go to them afresh, and let's believe that what Jesus did then, he can do now. Amen? Amen. Because I believe he can do abundantly more than we can ever wish or imagine. And I do believe for us, and actually I believe for this world, that the best is yet to come. Yes, yes. Because if, if this is what we've got, then what's the hope? What's the future? Yes. Jesus is our hope. Yes. He is our future. He is our very present help in times of trouble. He is in the miracle-making yes. business. Yes. And let's really approach these with, with, with that in our hearts. Um, a bit of a side to say I was a head teacher, and I don't think I've ever had to face the problems that Gary faced in Gulu, quite frankly. But on a day-to-day -day basis, there are many problems I have to face. And as 31 years as a head teacher of my school, I tell you, I have to focus on the solution, not the problem. Um, and I'm going to share five keys, if you like, which have been principles in my leadership as a head teacher, which have helped me. And I believe as we journey through these miracles, they might just help us to look at them afresh. Is that okay? Yeah. So if we could just bring up the slide. Um, the first thing I think, we've got to look at the context um, and the miracles. You know, where, where they were happening, who was involved. We've got to look at the problem that the people were facing. But we also have to look at the solution that Jesus provided. I want us to begin to look at the response of the people who were there at the time. And I want us as a church, as individuals, to look at the lessons that we might learn from them. Does that seem okay? Yeah. So I'm going to be talking about the context, I'm going to be talking about the problem, I'm talking about the response, look at the solution and the lessons that we learn. And actually, I want us to sort of approach these and say, okay, if these are lessons, perhaps they're lessons that we should learn individually, so often we can say this is a lesson that this person should learn, or that person should learn, or a church should learn. But let's sort of be honest with God. Let's be to God say, okay, we believe you're in the miracle-making business, and perhaps it could be that miracle might just need to start with me. Let's have a look at the, the first miracle, um, the, the miracle which is the, the changing of water into wine at Cana in Galilee. And... Just in terms of the context and the sort of introduction, I wonder why Jesus chose to perform his first miracle in private at a wedding. You know, as I look at it and I look at the symbolism behind it, the whole story talks about transformation. The whole story to me talks about creation. Yeah. It talks about change. And I know in this sceptical world in which we live, that sometimes we can say, oh, we can play down the miraculous. Oh, I don't believe that happened. Oh, but someone's elaborating it. And what I would say, you know, as we look at this first miracle, it's a miracle of, of creation. Yeah. I don't think it's any, any coincidence that right at the beginning of the Bible, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. He created I'd like to suggest this first miracle yeah. when Jesus yeah. created yeah. wine out of yeah. water yeah. is another creative yes. miracle. Yeah. Let's have a look. We run the video just to sort of see what was happening around about this time. It came in Galilee. I've got a video from, I think it's from um, Jesus of Nazareth, just to set the scene. Thank you. Two years later, there was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine had given out, Jesus' mother said to him, They are out of wine. 
you have to do with this? My time has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you. The Jews have rules about ritual washing, and for this purpose six stone water jars were there, each one large enough to hold between 20 and 30 gallons. Fill these jars with water. They fill them to the brink. Now draw some water out and take it to the man in charge of the feast. Jesus performed this first miracle in Cana in Galilee. There he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, Jesus and his mother, brothers and disciples, went to Capernaum and stayed there a few days. Okay, so it's just a little thing, shall we, about sort of the context of that. This is a wedding. Um, we can put the context slide up. <coughs> Nearly. So on the third day, it went into place at Canaan Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples have also been invited to the wedding. So, so weddings at that time were lavish affairs, okay? They, they lasted over a week. Um, one of the interesting things, as a dad who has funded three <laughs> weddings and one to come, it's a pretty it's sort of shame that sort of culture over there where it's actually the, it's, it's the groom, the groom's family who are responsible. Um, but sometimes things have to change. So it was a lavish affair. Um, and actually, some people would say these are the, the, the most important celebrations culturally at the time. And in that context, quite often would happen that the, sort of, the bride would be possessed, processed to the wedding venue. would normally probably happen Wednesday midweek. It wouldn't have happened on Saturday's tradition of the time in our time because that was the Sabbath. And... Celebrations for a week, there would be dancing, you would have seen, there would be music, there would be eating, there would have been drinking. And at that time, if you were at a wedding and you were to have run out of wine, then almost like a criminal offence, you would have brought social um, defamation of your character, it would have been something that you wouldn't be able to live with. And culturally, people would say, well, actually, if they can't even arrange wine for a wedding, how on earth is that groom going to look after the wife for the rest of, of their lives? And we do know um, that it says on the third day, well, three days earlier, uh, Jesus was at the Jordan and he'd been speaking to disciples. He's there, we know, with about five of his disciples. Some of the commentators suggest that the reason Joseph perhaps wasn't there, you'd think Mary take his husband, that perhaps at this time Joseph had died. 
Uh, we don't know that. It doesn't say in the Bible, but some of the commentators suggest that's the case because Jesus is there with his mother. And one of the things I want us to hold there is that Jesus was invited. Jesus was invited into a celebration, a normal situation. And first I'd like to say this this morning for us, whatever situation we find ourselves in, whether it be a wedding, and Jesus should be at the centre of a wedding, that invite Jesus into that situation. Whatever context you find yourself in, Jesus is there to be invited. So we're at the wedding. Let's have a look at the problem. You've got it. You don't need the slide. But actually, in terms there, we have no more wine. That is a big problem. <laughs> that is the problem. But Jesus was there. Jesus would have known the situation. But what I like to note there is that Mary, Mary identifies the problem. It's not Jesus. Mary identifies the problem. When I looked at that and I see Jesus' response, Woman, do you why do you involve me? If I said to Val, <laughs> Woman, <laughs> well, I tell you what, I wouldn't have got away with it. But you know, culturally, culturally at that time, that wasn't as sort of aggressive or defamatory as we would think about it. It was almost, um, if you like, um, we might say in our time, mom, a bit Downton Abbey-ish sort of thing. And, and actually, it was, if you like, a formal way of addressing someone, not a derogatory way of saying that. Do you get that? And some of the commentators suggest that in the same way that when Jesus was lost for a few days by Mary and Joseph, and he was saying, you know, I'm here to do my father's work. It's almost like a sign, a moment when, yeah, it's his mum, but actually I'm here to do my father's work. And, uh, and, and I think that's an important part because Jesus at this time, this is the first time that he's performing a miracle. And I don't know about you, is that, you know, if you were launching some campaign, would you do it in private? Would it be more appropriate that he was on that hillside with over 5,000 people yeah. to demonstrate to people? No, he did it in public. He did, he did it in private, not in public. And the one thing I notice here is that wine in that time was a symbol of joy. It was a symbol of joy. And, and to run out would have been a public disgrace. But what stands out for me, what Mary kind of... I don't think she's rebuked by Jesus. Plus, didn't get the response, the response that she went. But her response was, whatever he says, yeah. do it. And I think that's another message to us today. We need to invite Jesus into our situation. But whatever he says, yeah. do it. I don't know if you've picked out the sort of uh, face on one of the servants as he was actually pouring that water. Um, sometimes it can seem ridiculous, but we need to do it. And as I look at the solution, what I see in that solution is I see Jesus' compassion. I see his kindness, his sympathy, his understanding to ordinary people. Yeah. And taking an ordinary situation and doing an extraordinary thing. He tells the servants, quite frankly, to do something ridiculous. Now, just think about that. They're in this wedding situation to go and fill the ceremonial pots, the stone pots. You know, they were significant parts of the Jewish culture. They wouldn't have earthenware pots. These were stone pots. And to actually fill them with water could potentially defile them. It was countercultural. Jesus is countercultural. And just think about it for a minute. Those servants, you know, they would have had to go to the well to fill those six pots. Mathematically, that's about 180 gallons of water. Or if we're buying diesel at the moment, 180 gallons, and how much you pack? Uh, you know what I'm saying. Um, and however ridiculous it was, they did it. And you know, I think that the message to us is, if God speaks to us, we should do it. Sometimes we have to do the ridiculous, before God can do 
the miraculous. Yeah. You know, our part is to obey. Yeah. And the miracle part, that's up to him. Yeah. You see, when they draw the, drew the, draw the water out of the well, he turned it into wine. When the boy did the five loaves and two fishes, he fed the 5,000. When the, the, the waves were roaring in the seas, the storms we talk about next week, he calmed the storm because he is in the miracle serving business. And, and what I like about this, there's no half measures. There's no half measures. If we can go to the solution slide. His mother said, servants do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Look at this. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. They filled them to the brim. And, and church, this morning, I think the lesson for us is, whatever situation we're in, invite Jesus into it. Yeah. Whatever he says, do it. And whatever we do, do it to the brim. Okay? If you preach, do it to the brim. If you teach, do it to the brim. If you're working, do it to the brim. Because God is a God of abundance. He wasn't wants us to do it. He wants us to do it to the brim. And I think whatever situation you find in this morning, that is something that's really important. You see, for me, as I read that, there were no half measures. No half measures with Jesus. And he did immeasurably more than any of those people could have wanted, understood, or even comprehend. You know, that wine, a symbol of joy, 180 gallons, that goes a long way. What a lavish gift. Yeah. And you know, if Jesus invites us, we invite Jesus into a situation, and we, we, we give the problems to him, then he will do abundantly more than we could ever wish for. It sounds simple, but so often we, we, we miss the simple things. So the response was one of surprise. The master of the ceremony, he didn't know what was going on, but the servants did. You see, the miracle was achieved by God's words, but by the servants' actions. Good. I'll say that again. The miracle was achieved by his words and by his servants' actions. And we may hear God this morning. We might hear God. But we've got to have minds to understand what God is saying to us. Hearts that willing be changed and to change for him. Because it's the servant's actions that cause this miracle to happen. So in the response, for me, simply, the servants did their job. They did what they were told. The master was surprised, <laughs> couple were relieved, <laughs> and public disgrace was avoided. So I'm looking at this parable, this, sorry, this miracle, not parable, this, this miracle this morning, and the lessons to learn for me are quite simple. But you know, sometimes we can be too quick to make things difficult, to provide excuses, why not? And I wanna to say to us this morning, that the same Jesus who turned water into wine can continually transform your life and mine. An actual fact this morning, we are in, in a life, if you like, in symbolism, a room full of pots. Because what Jesus did in this miracle, this miracle of transformation, this miracle of change, this miracle of conversion, was something that happened on the inside. The outside appearance was the same. He changes from the inside out. Yeah. And what he did in this miracle, we need to do. We need to do what the married couple did. Invite him into the situation. You see, for me in this, Jesus didn't pay for the wine. It was a lavish gift. We don't have to pay for Jesus to come into our situation. We don't have to pay for salvation. It is a free gift. And I think in terms of the lessons, if we can come up, please. We need to invite him into the situation. Verse 1. We need to do whatever he tells us to do. 
And finally, we have to have faith yeah. to believe yeah. that he will do it. Do you get that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm going to turn now to a bit of symbolism. I can't get away without doing an assembly. Okay. <laughs> You've sat very well at the moment. Yeah. Um, but we're going to try and get it. I'm going to do something up here. And I don't want you to think, oh, I'm an adult. I don't need this. This is for kids. <laughs> it's not. But I'm going to challenge us now. I'm going to challenge myself. It's going to start with me, okay? And actually, I want you to think of the context of the situation in your life. I want you to think of some of the problems you are facing. I want you to think about some of the, perhaps the solution that you're desiring. I want to actually see, you know, in terms of what, our, what your response is going to be. And perhaps what lessons you've learned from the past. That's going to improve your future. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Okay. I'll go up the steps. <laughs> I'm going to say this could go drastically wrong, and it will be the biggest anticlimax I've ever done in my life, okay? <laughs> okay. I've got some iodine here, okay? If nurses amongst you know you're doing this. And I want you just to imagine for a moment that this just symbolises you and me. And actually, as I thought about this at a time set, oh, that's good, hello. Oh, I'm sure it is. Four packs there, I'll it. Okay, Lord, give me some hair, amen. Val will be saying, put your trousers up, John, your shirt's hanging out. Okay, so this is really exciting. This is the future, folks. This is the future. That's the miracle. We didn't know that's going to happen. <laughs> okay, so bear with me, okay? So I want you to think about your life, and, and, and I'm making light of this, but this is really quite serious, okay? I want us to think for the moment of those things in our lives which are perhaps blocking our relationship with God. Some of those things in our lives that are perhaps stopping the miraculous. You know, it could be fear, it could be anxiety. Anything else might be spotting us? Unbelief. Unbelief. Oops, I'm not a big one. Okay. Anything else? Business. Business. Okay. Oh, that's really good. It could be debt. It could be addiction. It could be worried about our families. It could be the worried about the world and what's happening to this world. It could be about Putin. Um, <laughs> well, seriously, these, these, these are things, I'm being real here. You know, it could be about the fear of World War Three. Let's yeah. be real about this. Yeah. 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 It could be some, some of the things we see in these pictures. Yeah. An actual fact, for a bit more for all those, because time is running out. But actually, what started off as a pretty good life, it's in a bit of a bad way, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of this, we can turn to people, we can turn to things to try and do it. So if you like, wash away all these things, this anxiety, turn to other things, like the some water, and we can, we can struggle and, you know, we do things by human means. Yeah, yeah. We might deny that miraculous could happen. Yeah. Wouldn't it be a miracle if people were released from debt this morning? Wouldn't it be a miracle yeah, if yeah, the anxiety yeah. lifted? Yeah, Wouldn't it be a miracle yeah, if there's yeah, peace yeah, in our heart? Yeah. Wouldn't it be a miracle at this very moment, Putin? Sh sh you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but actually, sometimes it just makes things worse. Yeah. And I tell you why that is, guys and girls. It's because we try to do things in our own strength. Yeah. Or we sometimes think, no, it, it, it will never happen to me. The miraculous might happen to someone else. A bit like being guru. I could breathe the miraculous for Gary sin about this water, but I had so little faith. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, we just got to think, let's, let's invite Jesus into this situation. John? Yeah? P Peter was asking if you can make it a 1922 Don Perry on. We'll just wait and see. You might just see that. <laughs> you just take my punchline away there. Thanks very much. No, but actually, so there's the mess. But we would say, Lord. Just come into my life afresh. I, I give you the anxiety. I give you the hurt. I give you the fear. I give you the lack of money. I give you my fear for the family. You know what I want, Lord. Lord, would you minister? Would you help me? Would you just do all you can to just 
Wash me, that I might be whiter than snow. Let me hear the sound of joy, the sound of gladness, because you who created the earth, you who created the heavens, the earth, flung the stars into the space, you who actually could do more than we could ever abundantly think we could do, you, Lord, can do it, because why? You are the God of the miraculous. Yeah. You are the yeah, God who went into yeah. Cana in Galilee, yeah. went into a wedding, the wine ran out, you turned the water into wine. You are the God who actually calmed the seas. Yeah. You are the God who was able to do immeasurably more. Thank you, Jesus. Forgive my unbelief. finish there. And guys, I think this is really crucial at the moment. The situation in Ukraine, peace, it starts with us. Yes, it yeah. starts with our prayers. Yeah. And actually, if we turn from our wicked ways, the Bible yeah. says, and we humble ourselves and yeah. come to God, God will heal our land. Do you yes. believe that? Yes. God yeah. will heal our land. And yeah. do you know what? When we sort ourselves out, look at the effect this can have on the world around us. morning I want us to be filled to the brim. Can you put my last slide up just as we finish? And what I mean for that is I want to come to Jesus and say Lord fill me afresh and when he filled those vessels to the brim I love I love um, play around with words in school where I will actually have Words to remind me things. I want you to leave this morning being filled to the brim for every situation. And what I mean for this is be, okay? Put the word brim up for me. Good spelling, John. Well done. Okay, so be, I want us to believe. Whatever situation we're in, God can do it. The R, I want us to receive God by his Holy Spirit this morning. I want to invite us in. And I want to make us a conscious effort that we would minister, move in whatever situation in the power of his Holy Spirit. Do you want that? Yeah. Let's stand together. Just close your eyes for a moment. We're here this morning to receive from God. When the world seems out of control, God is in control. And his word says, cast your burdens unto me, because I care for you. Bring those things before God right now. It might mean you need to ask forgiveness for something. There might be something that you're holding on to and you might need to release it. There might be anxiety. There might be worry. There might be stress. Real situations. Give them to God. He is the God of the miraculous. And you know what? The same Jesus who turned water into wine can transform any situation you're in right now, he's in the miracle working business. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open unto you. Come Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh. Fill us to the brim. Jesus. Jesus longs to bless you. To bless you and your family. And my prayer this morning... Lord would bless you. He would bless the people of Ukraine. He would cause his face to shine upon you.
and he would be gracious to you. And you would know his peace. Amen.